Hi, this is Jordan Moorhead, and this is the Austin Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, we have Michael Jones on, a real estate investor and a longtime lender in the Austin area. Hey, Michael, how are you? Hey, Jordan, I'm doing good. Great to have you on here. I know I've been trying to nail you down here for probably about six months, try to get you on the podcast. Um, can you tell our listeners who you are and how you're involved in real estate in the Austin area? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my nine to five, I'm probably not like uh, a lot of the folks that come on the show, but my nine to five is actually a mortgage. So I'm the chief financial officer for Thrive Mortgage, uh, headquartered out of Georgetown and uh, been in business for about 21 years at this point. Um, we lend all across the nation um, with a heavy emphasis here in Texas and all the loans you would think of, conventional loans, FHA, VA. Um, we also do some non-QM, some investor loans. So we do DSCR. Um, and we'll we'll do some interest only loans. We'll we've got a really interesting bridge loan that we're doing right now to help people actually buy a primary residence and compete with cash. Um, so that's my nine to five. And then uh, real estate actually is is somewhat new to me. As uh, funny as that sounds, in fact, I didn't pull the trigger on my own pulling you know purchasing an investment property for myself until about four and a half years ago. And uh, you know I was a little bit nervous to do it. I, I read as much as I could, listened to Bigger Pockets. You know probably. 150 or 200 episodes uh, and then pulled the trigger. And so it was a little house in uh, Temple, uh, Texas, uh, here up the road from us. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was a great experience. My first tenants were uh, Mennonites out of New Mexico. And so uh, wow. they didn't they didn't pull the copper out of the walls, which is good. Um, but they were great tenants and that, that got me started. So. How long did they stay there? Uh, about three years. They stayed through the pandemic and then, um, you know, like life took them somewhere else. I think they were moving out of state, but they were great tenants. They had a job transfer somewhere. Uh, something. Yeah. <laughs> something. I, I don't know anything about Mennonites. I'm thinking of Amish, I think. and I, I think they're probably completely different. They're similar, but they tend not to be as fundamental uh, as best I can explain it. You know, so. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you're newer to real estate investing but you've been in mortgage for a long time. When did you get into mortgage? Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, almost to the month. So, okay. you know, my past is uh, I, I'm a CPA. Um, and so I graduated from Baylor Sikkim uh, back in, uh, in 2010 and then started at PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, in Dallas in 2011, January 2011. So I thought I was going to be a partner there. Love the firm. Um, it's a really great firm, but just the grind coming out of the financial crisis was awful. I mean, public accounting has a bad name, but it was bad um, back then. And so I just looked at the chaos that was going on in the partners' lives and people above me. And I thought, man, I'm just, I'm going to work myself to death if I stay on this track. And, you know, it's not worth it to lose my marriage or, you know, never be around for my kids or something like that. So um, that's when I got into originating. Um, you got my, my loan officer license and I was able to make a name for myself as a loan officer because I could read tax returns. And I'd say 90% of the loan officers out there really can't read a tax return very well, or, or they get nervous because they want to make sure they give a good qualification to somebody. And if they're self-employed or they've got a lot of stuff going on, um, they get nervous and they back away. So that, that's really how I built my book of business. And then I trained realtors how to file their taxes. You know, how do you fill out a Schedule C or, you know, if you want to create an LLC, what what is wise to deduct and what's not? And, you know, what can you uh, what can you defend if you get audited by the IRS? So that that got me in the door with realtors and they would send me business. So that's awesome. Yeah. And I know realtors are a huge source of business for for loan officers. So you found a way to add value to the realtors. Um, just out of curiosity, what made being a CPA with Price Waterhouse so tough in 2008? Yeah, so um, the good thing that Price Waterhouse did, and, and not all firms can say this, is that they didn't lay people off, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a big help. Um, but they also had hiring freezes because they were trying to just make sure they could weather the storm and nobody knew how long uh, the fallout from 08 was going to last. So uh, they, because they were located in Texas, Dallas, obviously Dallas is one of the strongest markets in America. Um, and it was really, I think, getting a lot of uh, momentum because because other people were relocating to Texas companies at that point. So they were getting a lot of clients. And I specifically worked on private companies and high wealth individuals um, doing their taxes and advising them. So man, we just, we were nonstop busy and we couldn't hire fast enough or enough. And 
It was nuts. I, I literally spent my first busy season. I spent 24 hours in my cube, did not go home and to click the button to make sure that somebody's taxes got filed on time. So, wow. That's amazing. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. I know my accountant during tax season, he's just there seven days a week, 12 hours a day. It seems like a, a tough job. Um, yeah, so yeah, you got into mortgage about 10 years ago. What, what prompted the move down to Georgetown? Yeah, so uh, that's where we're headquartered. And okay. so I originated in Dallas for about three years. Um, so from 2012 to 2015, and then moved into our back office to take this position as the CFO um, to marry that mortgage knowledge along with the uh, accounting degree. Um, and so that that's what prompted the move. It just made more sense to be in the, the hub of the organization. Absolutely. So and then you started real estate investing about five years ago. Um, you, you mentioned a house in Temple. Are you mainly invested in the Temple area? Uh, primarily, I'd say um, I like to invest in Central Texas. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I've done some deals we can talk about um, and some things I'm working on right now. But most of my holdings are in Temple Belton. Um, so I now have six doors that are what I'll call single family residences. So, you know, um, I've got one duplex and then four just standalone properties and then uh, picked up an 18 unit apartment there in 2021. Um, mm -hmm. I actually went under contract right before ice Mageddon hit. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I'll remember that forever, but that's been an excellent uh, deal and got a Freddie Mac loan on that. And so that's been really? good. Small balance loan. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, let's see, the purchase price was 1.9. Um, so I think the mortgage was like 1.4, 1.5. So is that a B class or C class property? Man, I classify it. I think I'd actually classify it as a, or maybe a B plus. Oh, really? It, it was built in 20, 2018, 2019, something like that. So it was a brand new build and it's, it's a, a stone's throw from UMHP's campus. So it, it's a good property. That's great. Yeah, completely different. I know you and I have kind of talked just briefly about 18 units. I just sold an 18 unit. It was a C minus property, not close to any colleges, not new uh, for all those reasons, not good location, uh, older construction, not a, not a great tenant class because of that. And I, what has your experience been with this 18 unit? It's, it's basically brand new. Yeah, it's been great. Um, really just kind of minor things. And when the tenants move out, you know, you use the deposit to kind of clean up the unit and do some other things. Um, the biggest expense so far has just been re, uh, uh, repainting the, the, uh, parking spaces, you know, so that those look nice. And so that's really been it. And that wasn't that big of a deal, but I wanted to make sure the tenants didn't feel like they couldn't park in a straight line. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so important. People get arguments over that kind of stuff. So, you know, you mentioned that a lot of your investments are in central Texas or all really in central Texas. Why do you choose to keep investing in the central Texas area, especially with these things like prices going way up, property taxes going way up and stuff that really keeps people away from Central Texas. Yeah, I think what I learned from picking up the single family homes, and that's ultimately why I, I look to the apartment and why I've actually gotten into commercial, um, has been, if you look at the bang for your buck, whether it's the monthly cash flow, or you look at the multiple you can earn if you sell it, um, I just thought, man, I, I mean, it'll take me forever to build any sort of meaningful wealth with these single family homes. And so what has always gotten my attention is land. I love land because I can, I can look and see what's going on uh, in the market. Uh, I can make judgment calls about whether or not the development's coming there. I can see what business could operate there. And then you can also go talk to the city. I mean, the city is a wealth of resources to tell you, hey, you know, these businesses keep calling us, but they don't have space or we're planning on moving this direction. And so we're prepared to, to run certain uh, sewage line sizes and water sizes and all that kind of stuff. And so if you do it the right way, if you do your due diligence, and kind of follow a game plan, it's kind of hard to get burned um, as long as you don't do something foolish. And so that's why I like, I'll call it commercial, um, but it could be anything. Um, but I like land and I like developing land, which is what I'm holding right now. Awesome. So yeah, let's talk about that. So you, you know, you've mentioned a few times in the past minute or two, commercial and development. And I know Georgetown is just growing like crazy. Georgetown just can't get enough of everything. 
So what are you working on now here currently? Yeah, so I bought in, I see I closed on it in June of 2021. Uh, there were 34 acres at the Georgetown Little Municipal Airport that we have here. Mm. Um, and it's a well-known road, you know, pretty frequently traveled. And in fact, a Costco is about to come in right in that location. And so it was two different parcels. It was a 10-acre parcel um, literally touching the airport, and it was about a 23-acre parcel uh, aside from it. I mm. bought that at a buck 83 a square foot, which is just, I mean, dirt cheap, you know, yeah. I guess pun, pun intended, I guess, but dirt <laughs> cheap at a buck 83 a square foot. And so the sky's the limit when you pick land up that cheap. It has all the utilities. The zoning is good. There's no crazy changes. So what I did is I flipped the 10 acres um, and sold it for six bucks a square foot. Wow. Um, so bucket and I didn't have to do anything. I mean, like some minor stuff, you know, doing the paperwork. Uh, we're going to have to run a line under the road, but that's about it. Um, and so for a year's worth of work um, to get a three X on that is, is pretty substantial. The 23 acres, um, I've kind of waffled around. Am I going to sell this? Am I going to try to develop it um, right now? I'm going to develop it. And so I'm going to uh, I'm going to put a couple different concepts there. One is I want to put a food hall right there. I don't have any cool. restaurant experience and I certainly don't want to run, you know, a restaurant, but I want to put a food hall concept there where I can get five to 10 food vendors, you know, food trucks that maybe want to be food stalls now inside of a building and create a really fun family environment that people want to go to. Um, it'll focus on deliveries as well, has a cool outside area. Um, and it's right next to the airport, so you can literally see the planes taking off. And so there's some entertainment factor with that, just kind of watching the planes take off. Um, and then next to that, I think what I'm going to do is put in some self-storage. Um, nothing like a huge facility, probably a one-story facility that will also let people park their boats and RVs and, you know, just difficult things that they need to store. Um, and then I'm going to do a mixed use on about three or four acres, um, kind of in the the I guess it's like the southwest portion of this land um, where I'll put in either medical offices or just um, normal offices, you know, something that five, 10,000 square foot buildings, uh, hold those and rent them out. Um, and then there's about a quarter acre or so that I want to peel off and I'm going to donate it to an organization called Isaiah House, um, oh, which cool. helps kids that are entering the CPS system. Um, they kind of have a nice transition home before they end up going on to whoever's going to be their foster parent. So. That's awesome. So you're really doing everything with this land. You're going to have the food hall, you're going to have the storage, you're going to have the, the office space, and you're going to have some, some nonprofit space too. That's awesome. Yeah. 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 It'll be fun. That's why I like land. You can do anything you want. Yeah. The sky's the limit. And it sounds like Georgetown is actually very easy to work with too, for development. It's easier. Um, unfortunately, Austin. yeah, unfortunately it gets a little bit harder every year, but yeah, I've heard horror stories working with Austin. So yeah. 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 Just a, it's a smaller area, probably growing a lot faster, you know, percentage wise in Austin, but yeah, just I've heard great things about working with their city. I don't have a lot of experience myself. Um, cool. Awesome. So it sounds like you've got all sorts of plans. And I'm really excited to see where you go over here the next few years here because you've gone in the last five years from buying single family houses to duplex to 18 unit to now commercial development. I think that's a really cool progression. Was it was it really linear like that? Was it, hey, I'm going to buy a few houses, scale doesn't work, I'm going to buy multiple units that I need to get bigger, and now on to commercial? Yeah, no, whenever I started out, I thought, well, okay, I, maybe I'm going to shoot for like 10 or 20 homes, right? Mm -hmm. And so these homes in Temple Belton were about 150000 uh, a home, um, three, two bedroom, three bedroom, two bath, uh, located in a good school district, which was Belton ISD. That was one of my criteria. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to get wealthy slow i'm just going to let the tenants pay these things down and you know we'll just see where this goes but once i got into it i i wanted more right and, and you get comfortable like your risk tolerance begins to go up and mm -hmm. so that's where that's where i had that epiphany of man this is going so slow and i like land and i feel confident enough that i can go work with contractors you know um and actually build something. Um, and so that's what I did. Uh, the next project I took on was in Leander uh, where I took a one acre piece of land that had a mobile home on it. It was on a major thoroughfare there in Leander. Um, and, uh, 
And then I put a 10,000 square foot medical facility that I thought I was going to hold on to. Uh, WellMed actually uh, came in. That's kind of a regional uh, Mm -hmm. uh, physician's office. Uh, They came in, signed a seven year lease before I even broke ground on construction. Um, And so all these things started coming together where I thought, man, this is, this is sweet. You know, I mean, I did my homework, I did my due diligence and, and now this is coming together. And then I sold that in, went under contract in October, 2020 after I got it built. So it was built through 2019, open doors, March, 2020, just in time for the pandemic. Thankfully, WellMed honored their contract and paid and, you know, kind of saw patients on a limited basis. But then I put it on the market in October, 2020. And the, the money I walked away from that was $1.2 million. So the purchase price was like 2.9 and my all in cost to get the building up and all that kind of stuff was about 1.7. So I used that 1.2 to play plug it into that 34 acres I just described. Awesome. And so, yeah. I mean, that's the proof in the pudding there. Like I could either accumulate a million dollars over 30 years or maybe more, you know, for just buying a couple of these single family homes, or I can do that in 18 months and just rinse and repeat and get into bigger deals. And as, again, as long as you do your due diligence, you, you really reduce your risk of getting burned. So with that, with, you know, you develop that space how did you, how did you find WellMed? You know, so they came in, they put it under contract before you even had it built. Yep. How did they find you? Well, so a plug for realtors, right? So I used <laughs> a, I used a realtor um, who just, that was his book of business was working with medical offices. He knew the lingo. He knew what was good for the market there in terms of what comps were, um, you know, what you could get on a, on a building, if you developed it, what the rent should be. And so he went out and marketed it in his circles. And uh, ultimately that's how I found WellMed. That's awesome. Yeah. I think that's a a realtor. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. I think that's a great a great thing for people to hear is, you know, value is, is created. You know, you can either do value add projects or you can create, you can build from new. And there's so much more money in that than just, I, I, I don't like buying turnkey. I hate buying something turnkey. Um, it, it can work. You know, like you said, you've got newer apartments that can work well, but you can create so much more value just by either fixing something up or building new. Yep. And you're, you've got a great example of that. So I love that stuff. Yep. Awesome. So let's, uh, let's move on to mortgages. So I know that's just the hot topic. There's articles about it everywhere. People sometimes get it wrong. I think I don't know enough, but I talk to lenders and they say, Hey, well, what you read is actually wrong. Rates have gone up pretty considerably. Uh, I would say over the last year, um, this property I'm sitting in, I bought in October of 21 and I got a 2.5% mortgage rate which is pretty awesome. And I just got quoted a 5.25 to buy another owner occupied property here recently. So what have rates done over the last year? And what, what do you see them doing? Here? Yeah, I, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. They've gone up about 3% um, just across the board. Um, so, you know, investment properties up 3%, second homes, um, all that. There's really two, I would say, primary factors at play, um, and it and it really is driven by the Federal Reserve. So every time the the public hears, oh, the Fed has raised rates, that doesn't really impact mortgage, at least not directly. Um, if there is some sort of impact, it, it's in a roundabout sort of correlation type thing. But really what happened is the 10-year uh, treasury bond went up substantially, which mortgages tend to be uh, tied to the 10-year treasury. Very tight correlation over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and so as the 10-year treasury started going up, those same investors that buy those bonds also um, started reacting to that. And so that's that's the number one thing. And some of that is driven by the Fed saying, okay, we are not going to be as accommodative. And if they're not being as accommodative, that means they are not buying mortgage-backed securities. So if the demand for mortgage-backed securities has gone down, down, supply and demand states that the premiums, the price, uh, the interest rate and the yield has to go up to attract those buyers in. And so the Fed was a major player in the market in 2020 and 2021. I mean, they what they did was unheard of and probably nobody would have imagined they would have taken the actions they did. So that's what drove rates down into the twos. Now that they're not engaging in those same practices, the rates are spiking. 
And the other thing at play here is inflation. You know, we, we say our stated rate of inflation is 9.1%. It's really much higher than that. But the one that gets published is say 9.1 or 9.2. Well, the problem is, is when your rates are at 2%, which is where they're at now, 2.5% after the Fed's rate latest hike, you're, you're 6 and 7% under the real rate of, of return or the real interest rate that is needed because inflation is eating away the rest of that. So rates in general are going to have to go up because the only way to kill inflation well there's two ways the one way to kill inflation is to raise rates so high that you reduce the demand and then the other way to fix this inflation at least would be to introduce more supply into the marketplace of just everything because a lot of what we're dealing with right now is supply driven inflation yeah. there's not enough homes there's not enough chips there's not enough whatever and mm -hmm. so the price has spiked on these things whereas if it were solely based on what happened with the amount of money in circulation that would be a little bit different and you can choke that down a little bit easier with these rate increases and with increasing the amount of cash that banks have to hold which the fed can dictate but anyway we're in a mess right now um so rates have probably spiked as best i can tell on mortgages um, that doesn't mean they can't go up maybe a maybe a little bit higher but they hit a peak of about six to six and a quarter on a primary residence i mean that's what your average joe was out there quoting and that was only 45 60 days ago they have since come down we're probably in the mid fives at this point low five you know what you just heard um and that's probably where we're going to bang around um i think there is there tends to be a trend when you go into a recession rates tend to go down mm -hmm. um and so i would expect that they could trend down but the one thing that's unique, and I'll quit preaching here about mortgage-backed securities, is that the Fed has continued to say, hey, we're going to let these things roll off our balance sheet, and that new supply is going to hit the market. And so if they're not the ones that are mopping up the supply, there's also that that could impact mortgage rates and cause rates to go a little bit higher because they are not reinvesting those uh, roll-offs by buying more mortgage-backed securities. So. Yeah, no, and I, I love that. And you really went in, in detail there. And I think people get so confused. They, they hear that, hey, the Fed's raising the rates and they think, okay, that means everything. That means mortgage rates are going up. That means car rates are going up. And and like you said, in, in a way, they all will go up a little bit. But I like how you really explain there. And I know enough to be dangerous, but I, I know that mortgage rates are, are highly tied to you know, a 10 year treasury, because in my head, the 10 year treasury is probably the most secure investment you could make. You know, the 10 year treasury bond is one of the most secure investments you can make. Typically, the government always pays. Um, hopefully, they keep doing so. <laughs> yes, but, hopefully so. <laughs> but, you know, if I'm going to buy a 10 year treasury bond or a mortgage backed security, you know, the mortgage backed security in, in my head would be a little riskier. So I would want a slightly higher return on that. Um, is, does it work that way hand in hand where, hey, I would rather buy this or this and this one's more secure. So I'm willing to take a slightly lower return. Yeah, it, that's definitely a, a component of it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there there is you're right. The 10 year Treasury mm -hmm. is from the Treasury. And so obviously they're going to guarantee payment on them. What's interesting about mortgage, and this wasn't always true, but it became true with the bailout and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac having to go into conservatorship, that, that just means that the federal government owns them right now, um, is that there, beca there became this implicit guarantee that they too are fully backed by the federal government. And that arguably is correct. So, you know, there there is that sense that yes, Fannie and Freddie may not get bailed out again, you know, if push came to shove. Um, and so that may make mortgages a little bit more risky. Uh, but um, the paper that has been written over the last decade or more coming out of the financial crisis is so much safer and so much stronger than ever was before. These, these requirements have been rock solid. They haven't really changed. They really haven't loosened up very much. Um, and so it's good paper. Um, one of the things that impacts investors' desire is also duration. So a mortgage theoretically can endure, can last for 30 years. That bond will last for 30 years, whereas a 10-year treasury, 
it's going to last for 10 years. So that duration also impacts it as well, because you're not committing money for up to 10 years, you're committing money for up to 30 years, assuming that mortgage pays off or it doesn't pay off early. And with rates as low as they have been uh, over the last two years and where rates are at now, arguably we're not going back down as low as we were. We may come back down a little bit, but we're probably not going into the twos again unless something catastrophic happens and the Fed opens up the spigot. So the mortgages that are being written now and, and into the future will have a four or five or 6% interest rate, which can be pretty attractive, but you're, you're, you're gonna have to tie that money up for a while because they're probably not gonna refinance. And with inventory as low as it is, they may or may not move and sell their home and pay off that mortgage. Yeah. Awesome. So, you know, real, and I want to clarify this point a little bit for the people listening and, and also for myself. So what I've read and what I've heard is in the last couple of years, really the last decade, the, the Fed was a huge buyer of mortgage-backed securities. And I heard something crazy. I heard it was like over 50%. Uh, am I wrong there? No. Uh, I mean, last year in April, that's really when it hit. Um, the Fed completely uh, bazookaed the markets. Um, they came out and basically said, we're buying everything out there. And so, yeah, they, there were times whenever they were at least 50% of what was uh, being purchased. Um, and uh, I mean, there was probably a few days or a few weeks where it was 100% because the secondary markets completely locked up. I mean, we almost had we almost had a repeat of the financial crisis in the sense that like money wasn't moving, you know, but no investors were buying loans from us. The only people that would buy loans from us is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And thank God we had a relationship with them because they were in, and they did exactly what they were designed to do, which was, they were the backstop. They were the liquidity machine in the market that they were designed to be. And so we could sell our loans directly to them instead of having to go to a Wells Fargo, a Penny Mac, a, a mayor home, you know, whoever it is you're familiar with. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the Fed, the Fed's influence over the last two years is crazy. Uh, and honestly, I think that's part of the reason why the stock market hasn't crashed more than I think it should. It's for the reason why real estate prices are as high as they are because people are sitting here expecting that the Fed will come in to save the day. And the Fed has been responsible for the stock market going from 22,000 on the Dow, now up to 32,000 in just a two year period of time, unprecedented uh, increase, crazy. And this, nobody can know this, but you know what? What does it look like if they don't, they don't go back and start buying bonds again? So you talked about that they're they're letting them roll off, so they're letting them mature, and then they're not buying new mortgage-backed securities. Um, do you, and you already kind of hit on this point, but if that happens, do you see rates continue to go up a lot, or are we kind of where we're at? You think? Um, there is an argument to be made for that to cause rates to continue to go up um, to the to the same on the same side of that coin. If rates go up too much, and we've seen this in all of our markets, people stop buying homes. I mean, they just flat out do, and inventory begins to build up, and um, and so that's good and bad, right? Like we need more inventory, but it happening too quickly is a problem. And so there's an argument to be made that the Fed could actually be forced to start buying bonds again if the market were to get really illiquid or for rates to go up, um, because the housing. The, the housing industry in America is 16% of our GDP. So the builders, the realtors, the mortgage guys, the painters, the renovators, the everybody, 16% of this nation's economy is tied up in housing. And so the Fed knows that. They're, they're not blind to that fact. And so for them to nuke 16% of our GDP would be catastrophic. So they won't, they won't do something or uh, continue a practice that will will harm and destroy the economy. I'm convinced, I mean, I'm hopeful, I'm convinced of that. Um, so I think that while they want to back off of these purchases, they would step in if they had to, and them not purchasing does cause rates to go up. But there's enough other demand out there. You know, there's a lot of uh, the Bank of Japan, Bank of England, Bank of Canada, you know, all these central banks may purchase mortgage-backed securities because they're a relatively safe investment, uh, because that helps offset, you know, some of their hedging and equities and all that kind of stuff. The the New York um, 
pension fund for firefighters may purchase it because, you know, a 5% return on that bond, which is pretty safe and maybe guaranteed by the government, it's not a bad bet. You know, you can either buy a 10 year treasury at two and a half right now, or you can buy a five, 5% 5 mortgage bond. Well, you know, depending on what your objectives are, that's not bad. So there's enough demand out there that I think it would help to replace the Fed. Okay. Good perspective. I like that. Awesome. So, you know, I know that that everybody's saying, hey, these rates are making my, my deals not work. Um, what's something you could tell an investor to do to help be creative with, with financing to get the deal to work? So I know compared to where they were last year, it, it was hard to buy a property last year. Now the properties are more plentiful, but it's hard to finance them right and make money. What are you going to tell an investor that's looking to buy right now? Yeah, um, you know, I think it, it kind of depends on what uh, what stra uh, what kind of investment you're willing to make. So, mm -hmm. if you're wanting a turnkey property, you know, you could always do seller financing. Um, there are some opportunities there. There's reasons why a seller may want to do that. Um, so that would be something a little bit outside the norm they could do. Uh, if they needed to, they could try to put together um, partners that care more about maybe a longer term play than they do cash flow. And so having enough equity to lower the loan amount where a higher interest rate does make the deal make sense can help. Now, obviously you're trading one thing, you know, maybe future appreciation, equity, what have you um, for another. But if, if you're just trying to make some deals work, um, that's something that can help. Um, and then if you're looking to build, um, which, you know, your, your options there can be a little bit more unique, um, I think, Having a strong balance sheet is very helpful. That helps you get lower interest rates. And so you might have a, a wealthy friend or somebody that says, hey, I'll let you use my balance sheet uh, so that you can get better banking terms because the bank's going to give you a much better rate if they feel like they've got to compete for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another strategy, um, you know, a little bit outside the box. But I think there's a lot of people with healthy balance sheets out there that want something sort of attractive and safe and they can put their hands on because um, I know people are scared of the stock market right now. Yeah, absolutely. So and another question, I was actually sitting at a dinner with someone, uh, a friend of my father's who bought their home, I want to say back in the 80s, actually. And they said, hey, the reason we bought this home is because we could assume their mortgage, and then they would hold a second. What does that look like? And I know, I know that people are trying to get creative. But what does a loan assumption look like? And are people allowed to hold second mortgages on them too for that gap? Yeah, no, good question. Um, honestly, assumable mortgages sort of keep me up at night um, because <laughs> if uh, the government actually will allow an FHA loan and a VA loan to be assumable, um, and I think a USDA loan is assumable as well. And what that means is that really the mortgage company doesn't make any money on them. Um, because we already wrote the mortgage once, we may be servicing it now so we can continue to make the servicing income if it performs, but we're, you're swapping the borrowers out with the same terms of the original mortgage. So that could be really attractive for all of these homeowners that got their two and a half, their 3% mortgages, even if they refinanced them, um, to let somebody come in and assume their mortgage and maybe pay them more money or work out some sort of a side deal. Um, because that, I mean, that can make the, that can make it work for these borrowers um, or not. The, the only catch is, is that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do not allow assumable mortgages right now. Um, that, that's not something that they allow. You know, it's kind of written into the note, whereas FHA <laughs> excuse me, and VA do. So that would be the limitation is you couldn't assume a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac mortgage, but you could a government mortgage. Okay. And in that case, so let's say somebody bought with an FHA mortgage, uh, in 2020, and they got a two and a half rate. Yep. There's going to be a large gap in equity there. So let's say they bought for 350. The property is now worth 550. Can they finance that gap as far as a seller carry back, or how how can they finance that gap and not just bring the cash? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, it's really not something that that the uh, the original lender would get involved with um i would say it is allowed you know however they need to get the cash or if it was a seller carry uh, because the lender is just swapping those borrowers out so mm -hmm. yeah i'd say that's a solution to pick up that property cool 
Yeah, that seems like a good option for a lot of people out there. Of course, you have to figure out, do they have FHA, do they have VA? And it sounds like USDA can also work. Um, absolutely verify that stuff before you enter into a purchase contract. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, these could be creative options. Another thing that I'm seeing a lot of, a, a lot of from new home construction is offering rate buy downs. Can you explain what a buy down is and how people can take advantage of it when they're buying? Yeah, so there's two different types of buy downs. There's a permanent buy down and a temporary buy down. Um, and so a permanent buy down is where the seller, the builder, um, basically is giving you credit to pay for the points that you need to pay for in order to take your rate from five and a quarter down to five permanently. Um, and so th that gets paid to the mortgage company and then we lower the rate for the borrower. A temporary buy down it's something a little bit more unique, not, not as many people take advantage of that, although it makes a lot of sense, is you qualify at the highest rate. So going back to our example, let's say the highest rate you qualify for is five and a quarter. What will happen is the seller or the builder will put in escrow for your benefit the two years worth of interest that you don't have to pay, but they're paying for you. So on a two one buy down, for example, instead of a five and a quarter, your first year's interest payment will be based on three and a quarter. Then the second year it hikes up to four and a quarter. And then that final year and for the rest of the 28 years on that loan, it's at five and a quarter, it's fixed forever. It doesn't, it doesn't adjust anymore. So they're really just paying some of that interest on your behalf. And it sometimes is a good step stone into a payment, particularly you know when, when house prices have gone up so much uh, from like rent or maybe somebody that's never paid a mortgage before. Maybe they're just you know graduating from college for the first time and not living with mom and dad anymore. But that step up in the payment can be helpful um so how do you qualify someone for something like that are you qualifying them based on what the payment's going to be in two years or what it's going to be year one yeah it's always worst case right so you always okay. look at what the highest payment will be because we don't want to set them up for failure in fact the, the the law the underwriting will not allow it anyway you have to qualify at the higher rate okay no I, that that's good to know and i think you know if most people I talk to, mostly economists, lenders, you know, people paying attention to where they think the economy is going, think that here in the next two or three years, rates will probably be lower than they are today or will be in the next six, six months to a year. Um, that might be a good way to maybe roll the dice and say, hey, it, it works at this highest rate, but I'm going to take the chance and maybe I can get it down here in a year or two. Yep. Yep. No, I, I think so. And I know there's a, you know, social media post going around of like, uh, what is it? Marry the home, date the rate or something like that, or date the payment. And so it is that belief that we're probably not going to be in this uh, interest rate environment of 6% um, for the long term. Um, mm -hmm. You know, honestly, I, I think I think for the U.S. housing market to be healthy, it probably needs to be in the four to four and a half percent range long term. Um, and so I do think there is an argument that rates generally and with mortgages goes down, um, you know, six, 12, 24 months from now. Absolutely. And I think something that a lot of people overlook, too, that I, I talk to, especially in the real estate industry, they say, well, you know, but seven percent is the historical average of the rate. And in my head, I'm saying, OK, maybe it is. But where the prices are now, if you add in that 7% rate, that becomes unaffordable for so many people. So I, I kind of agree with you that we probably need rates down a little lower for housing to be affordable for people. Oh, for sure. I mean, the, the home prices are, they're way too high. Um, now, I don't think they're going to necessarily come crashing down because mm -hmm. of the way the supply and demand is working. And we don't have exotic loan products and toxic loan products and that kind of stuff. But um yeah, it, it the 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 home prices are a problem. Um, I think I've seen in Texas. I think the average is up three hundred and twenty four percent since twenty twenty, or something like that. I'm sorry, two two thousand three hundred and twenty four percent since wow. two thousand. And yeah. I mean, it's just like holy smokes, um, you know. So. Yeah, no, it certain, and it's become such an attractive place for businesses to move over that period of time too. That so many people have moved here and bought homes and bottom at great mortgage rates. So yeah, I, I don't think prices are going to come crashing down, but we're already seeing prices adjust down a little bit mm -hmm. here in Austin, especially because they went up so much and then rates went up and now 
it's not affordable for a lot of people. Um, <clears throat> awesome. So I really enjoyed the conversation. What's one thing you tell somebody when they're getting started investing? So if somebody comes to you and says, Michael, you know, I'm looking to get started investing here. I don't own a home, but I, you know, I just graduated from college here a little bit ago. What would you tell that person or a newer investor? Yeah, I think the uh, probably the most prudent best thing you can do is protect your downside. Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't do you any good to put together other people's money or your own money and not be prepared for something bad, you know, a COVID type event, or mm -hmm. even if it's just a run of the mill, like, hey, the tenants just quit paying or, or what have you. If you're not financially capable of weathering the storm, then I'd say it's dangerous and risky to get into investing in real estate because you know, while it's a relatively liquid asset, there's still carrying costs and it takes time to buy and sell and, you know, what have you. So, you know, that I don't want to, if, if you're too risk averse, you can't actually get out there and make a deal happen, but you really have to just make sure you're prepared for a bad scenario because you don't want your first uh, entry into real estate investing to go poorly and then it burns you for the rest of your life and you don't ever want to do it again. Um, and so I think it's just making sure you've got your safety nets, doing due diligence, asking questions, you know, partnering on your first deal is never a bad idea. You learn so much. It may accelerate the speed at which you can do things. Work with knowledgeable people like a realtor. I love working with realtors, even if I have my real estate license and I often choose not to use it uh, to save the commission or put the money in my pocket because the advice and having other people do some things for me is, is that helpful. So leaning on them is, is a good opportunity. Um, and then I think the, the last thing is probably it's, it's easy to succumb to shiny object syndrome uh, whenever you're investing in something and real estate's got a lot of different things. Yeah. And so you got to think, do I care about cash flow? Do I care about future equity? Um, do I do I feel really confident about office space or do I want to get in single family homes? So, you know, figuring out what your flavor is, because if you don't like your investment, it's kind of hard for you to be passionate about it. It's hard for you to get creative. And, and so, you know, even in real estate, you can get passionate about something like I'm passionate about land. Um, so I, I would say just invest in something you care about. Absolutely. If it's not fun, you're not going to keep doing it um, like that. I think it's all about being in it for the long term. Um, so what's next for you, Michael? You, it sounds like you, you've you gone from single family to multifamily to, to land development. Where are you going in the future? What's your long-term vision? Um, I, I want to be a, uh, I want to be a space titan. So space I, I say that like outer space, right? And mm -hmm. so you know, I'm trying to look at how can I invest in real estate? How can I, uh, you know, maybe invest my real estate? Uh, I was going to say winnings. Um, this, this isn't the lottery, <laughs> uh, but my real estate gains uh, mm -hmm. into pursuing that passion. Because um, I think there's so much opportunity right now, investing in space companies and rockets and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but as it relates to real estate itself, um, I think I am, I'm, I'm paying attention to manufactured housing. Um, I'm paying attention to affordable housing because the haves and have nots are going to continue to expand out and having making ends meet for folks is going to continue to be hard for any number of reasons. And so I'm interested in less flashy but cash flowing affordable real estate, which manufactured homes offer, which RV parks offer, which, you know, B and C um, apartments offer. And so that's what I'm trying to focus on. Um, you and I are in GoBundance and somebody uh, posted about an apartment in Temple where I invest in um, that, you know, they're looking for some deals on. So I'm going to continue to look for those opportunities in the markets I feel comfortable with. Uh, and then I'm really excited about this food hall concept um, that I'm probably going to get off the ground here towards the end of the year. That's awesome. Yeah. No, and I also love affordable housing. I think it, it makes you feel good to be able to offer a nice place for somebody to live, but it's still affordable too. And because housing has become so unaffordable. It's crazy. You know, building luxury stuff would be cool, but I, I'd much rather make a, a an affordable place nice. You know, it doesn't have to be a Taj Mahal, but oh, it's yeah. going to be nice. Well, and talk about recession proof, right? Like you're yeah. taking a big risk on the A plus space because, you know, that's where the money tends to flock and, and you know, it's it's easy for people to upgrade their lifestyle and, and leave your apartment. But if, if you're in the affordable apartment space, 
uh, you're recession proof, right? I mean, you're sort of bulletproof as long as you take good care of the property, take good care of your tenants um, and make it just a, a desirable place to live. Um, and I, I'm even interested in some Section 8 stuff um, because, again, you're, you're talking about protecting your downside. If the federal government is guaranteeing you that you're going to get paid every month, talk about a home run, you know? And, and rents go up pretty quickly with Section 8 too. I know a lot of Section 8 landlords that, and their rents have just gone through the roof over the last couple of years. And again, yeah, mostly that's paid by the government. Yep. So that can be some good stuff. But everything has its own own challenges. You know, everybody, it <laughs> everything sounds sexy on paper. And then you start to do it and everything has challenges, you know. Mm -hmm. so figure out what works best for you. Uh, Michael, do you have a favorite business or mindset book that you like to recommend to people? Um, you know, one of, uh, yes, a couple and I'll make them short and sweet. So the richest man in Babylon is yeah. fantastic. I mean, that's, that's like the finance Bible right mm -hmm. there. Um, and I read it at least once a year, uh, probably twice. Um, never split the difference is phenomenal. Um, and I really enjoy the audio version of that because the, the narrator is, he's got an entertaining voice to listen to, but I've used that. In fact, I'm, I'm listening to it back to back right now. Um, I've used it multiple times in negotiations to save our company tens of thousands of dollars. I've used it, um, you know, trying to pick up deals. So there's really good life lessons that will actually help you succeed. Um, and then I'm trying to think a mindset book that really kind of changed things for me. I, you know, one thing that did kind of help me back in 2014, I'd always been kind of interested in personal development, but I picked up Hal Elrod's book, The Miracle yeah. Morning. Love uh, that. Yeah. And, you know, the routines it talks about, it's very doable. It helps you own your day. And if mm. you actually will commit to those steps, it's, it's what will actually change your life, where some of these other things are less actionable. I think his Miracle Morning book is really good. In, in your entire life too. So it changes everything. If you get up and you have, I used to not be a morning person. I was forced to wake up early for so many years. And then once I got out of that and got into real estate, I'd wake up at eight o'clock or so, yep. um, get going. And since I've had a morning routine, I just, I'm so much more focused and I've been so much more successful because of it. Yep. I think that you can't overlook the miracle morning. And there are so many different versions that everybody's going to resonate with. Yep. So look it up. There's a version for you. Yep. Michael, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you or follow you on any sort of social media? Yeah. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, I mostly like space stuff on Twitter. Um, so yeah. I don't know if that would help people too much, but I actually do. Uh, I do follow a lot of uh, economic and real estate type uh, data statistics. Mm -hmm. um, so if they follow me, they'll be exposed to some of that and that, that may help them in their investing journey. Um, I would say, you know, email. I'm always happy just to kind of chat with folks and, and help answer questions. Um, since I've been exposed to a number of different types of real estate, um, you know, that, that may help them. Um, but yeah. Okay. And just for everybody, we'll put this in the show notes too, but what is your Twitter handle and what is your email? Yeah. Twitter handle is I am Mike Jones uh, <laughs> for Twitter and it's got a picture of me on there. And then uh, my email address is michael.jones at thrivemortgage.com. Yeah, and for everybody listening, the reason I laughed is there, there was a rapper, I probably still is a rapper named Mike Jones out of Houston. And he had a song where he said his name over and over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was infamous after that song. Yeah. Yeah, I know he's talking about you. Uh, Michael, last question here, most important question we ask, what is your favorite restaurant in the Austin area? Yeah, th this one may, this won't come as a surprise for anybody that knows me, but Chipotle is my favorite restaurant <laughs> and it doesn't matter where it is. Chipotle is, is my go-to. I would eat there seven days a week if I could. Yeah, you can always get healthy food. That's what I like about it. It's always right. the same. You're always going to get the same exact thing. Yep. It's like McDonald's, but healthy. <laughs> right. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on here, Michael. I'm glad we were able to finally schedule a time. Um, so anybody that wants to reach out to Michael at I am the Mike Jones on Twitter or I am Mike Jones on Twitter and then michael.jones at thrive.com. Uh, thrive Mortgage, M-O-R-T-G-A-G-E.com. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, we will get that in the show notes too. But 
I think just uh, really, really appreciate you coming on here and we will talk here soon. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Michael.